All right, good morning, everyone. We are so happy to have you join us for our fourth webinar in our Arbor Day series. My name is Gwen Kozlowski, and I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator with the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. Uh, this is our most popular webinar so far, and we have many friends of our program on, on today. But for those of you who are new to us, the UCF team is a collaborative effort between UVM Extension and the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. We provide technical, educational, and financial assistance to communities to, and, and to stewarding their tree resources. You can learn more about our work at vtcommunityforestry.org. Before I hand it over, I've got a few housekeeping items. Your microphones will be muted during the presentation and there's no video option for participants. If you have questions during the webinar, please put them in the question box in the side panel and we will address those after the presentation. If you have any other comments or questions, please feel free to put those in the comment box as well. Credits. This presentation is eligible for one ISA, SAF, or Vermont Forester License CEU. To receive credit, you must fill out the survey with your name and license number. The survey should pop up once you exit the <coughs> webinar and will also be emailed to you one hour after the presentation. So if for some reason it doesn't pop up, you will get emailed um, the survey as well one hour later. And I know everyone's getting a lot of emails uh, these days, so I'm trying to number, minimize the number of emails that I send out after the webinar. So if you'd like an SAF certificate of attendance for SAF or Vermont Forester, uh, it is available as a handout for you to download yourself in under the handout section in the side panel. Uh, but if that doesn't work, just mark on the post webinar survey that you need to be emailed a SAF uh, certificate and I'd be happy to do so. This webinar is being recorded and will be available later today on vtcommunityforestry.org. And I will be emailing anyone who had signed up for this webinar. Uh, we are delighted again to have so many of you on today. Very much thank you to Kat Buxton of Grow More Waste Less, who will be leading our webinar today. Kat is a very active and dedicated educator. She is a co-founder of the Vermont Healthy Soils Coalition and coordinator of the Upper Valley Apple Corps, uh, among many other things. Uh, but before I hand it over to, to Kat, oh boy, um, <laughs> we uh, could all learn from her wealth and knowledge and experience. I just wanted to do a few quick polls to get a sense of who is in the audience. So I'm gonna launch the first poll to see where folks are located. How about that? My phone wasn't on mute. <laughs> All right, we'll do another 10 seconds or so. All right, I'm gonna close out this poll. We've got 30, 43% in Northwest Vermont, a few from the Northeast Kingdom, a couple from Central Vermont, and a few from outside Vermont. All right, we'll close that poll. And let's see. I'm going to send out the next one. Do you represent a community or, or organization? If you manage a community space, you're here to learn a little bit more, or you want to learn some more about your own garden, or both of the th those things, or neither. All right, and we'll do another five seconds on this poll. All right, I'm gonna close that out. Uh, we've got a few people here that manage a community space. Most would like to learn more about their own garden, about quarters say both, and a few folks are here just to learn some more. And the last poll, are you currently growing fruit and nut trees? Yes, not yet. I've got plans to grow them, or I'd like to, but I'm here to learn some more. All right, we'll do another 10 seconds or so on this poll. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll. 
We've got 42% that say, yes, they've got trees, fruit and nut trees growing, 4% 4 not, 4% not yet. A quarter say they've got plans and about 40% say they'd like to, but here to learn more. Uh, so thank you so much for entertaining those polls. And Kat, I'll turn it over to you and we can't quite see your presentation anymore. There, there we go. Okay, Perfect. great. Well, welcome everybody. Um, oh, where'd my presentation go now? I'm gonna turn my video off maybe. Here we go. Can you see my presentation? Yes, all set, go ahead. All right, great. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, so glad to be here. Um, Kat Buxton, Grow More, Waste Less is my business and also my website, growmorewasteless.com. Um, lots of free resources up there that I welcome you to check out, videos, handouts, etc. cetera. Um, and I'm so glad to be here. Talking about soil health and edible landscapes. Um, so in my presentations, I focus a lot on soil health. The first part of my presentation is, is pretty exclusively about soil health in the context of supporting growth above the ground. And then we'll get into some of the public plantings and food forest type stuff that I'm involved with uh, toward the end of the presentation. So what is on your screen now are the soil health principles. These top four were designed by the NRCS, which is the Natural Resources Conservation Service. The fifth one was coined by a guy named Gabe Brown, who is a rancher from North Dakota, one of my mentors. He's written a great book called Dirt to Soil. I highly recommend it and get the narrated version because he narrates and it's really great to hear his story in his voice. Um, and the sixth one, slow and sink the water just makes sense and if you follow the top five the sixth will happen so i'll briefly touch on these here and then throughout the presentation the first one is living roots in the ground that means living roots with green growing plants on top for as long as possible throughout the calendar year these green growing plants are conducting photosynthesis and that's a really important part of nutrient cycling and we'll, we'll get into that a little more in our region that means likely a lot of conifers which is what our natural environment wants to provide which is interesting um, but certainly not exclusively the second one is maximize diversity and that is above the ground and below the ground in numbers of species in types of species and varieties in heights, in leaf shape and size, in timing of flowers, all above the ground and below the ground, lots of roots, lots of different kinds of roots, lots of microorganisms and macroorganisms, lots of soil organic matter of various kinds. That's maximizing diversity. Minimizing disturbance refers a lot to tilling, um, and also use of chemicals, um, fertilizers, and pesticides that would damage soil life. Um, and notice that it says minimized and not no. Disturbance is natural. Flooding, volcanoes, earthquakes, avalanches, drought, etc. These are all kinds of disturbances. But we want to try and minimize the amount of disturbance that we inflict upon the landscape. The fourth one, no bare soil. It's very rare in nature that there would be bare soil in large tracts. Um, so I'm not talking about the tiny bare soil spots in your lawn that are necessary for certain insects or the rock scree pile in the woods um, that is also necessary for a lot of animal homes and insect habitat. Um, but I am talking about large tilled areas uh, and that's really what this refers to is lots of bare soil without green growing plants conducting photosynthesis and nutrient cycling. The fifth one, animals in contact with soil, really is just talking about integrating animals into ecosystems. And this could be ruminants like cows or sheep or could be goats or, or pigs or chickens, but it's also referring to deer and moose and bugs and butterflies and birds and bees, uh, grasshoppers, these are all parts of natural systems and nature never farms without animals. And again, the sixth one, slow and sink the water makes sense. We're gonna talk more about that. 
I don't like to read my slides, and there's a lot of words on this one, so while I'm talking, I'm hoping that you're reading them. I will point out a few specific things that I like to always talk about when I talk about soil. One is that a tablespoon of healthy soil could have over a billion organisms in it. Healthy soil, which is different than dirt. So dirt is sand, silt, and clay. It's rock broken down. Soil is all of that with soil organic matter and all of the organisms that come with that soil organic matter because they're eating it. They're um, processing it into nutrients. In that teaspoon or, or tablespoon of soil, my slide says teaspoon, but I'm pretty sure it's actually a tablespoon, you can find up to 75,000 species of bacteria, 10,000 protozoa, a few hundred nematodes, and maybe a macro or micro arthropod. In addition to that, a mile of fungal hyphal filaments. So what those are, are the teeny tiny little hyphae, which is the filaments of fungus under the ground. If you look at that little picture of the pine sapling, most of what you're looking at there is mycorrhizal fungus, not the actual roots of that pine. Those mycorrhizal filaments, that the mycorrhizal network, has a relationship with that little pine sapling, and it's uh, advancing the, the, the intelligence of the soil to increase nutrient cycling. We're gonna talk more about that as we go through. The other thing I like to point out is that a 1% increase in soil organic matter, which is often referred to SOM, um, in the top six inches of soil per acre can hold up to 20,000 gallons of water. Certainly there are some variables in that fact. If you have clay soil or if you have sand soil or if you're on top of bedrock, some of those are, that's gonna change a little bit. Um, soil organic matter is the living, the dead, and the very dead. And this is also carbon. So carbon, when we talk about carbon sequestration, pulling carbon down from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide down and turning it into carbon, we're just advancing natural carbon cycling that uh, has always happened, thankfully, that's why we're here. Um, but our land management practices globally have really disrupted that cycle because we've, we've actually taken away a lot of the green growing plants in large tracts of earth. Soil organic matter is the living. So that's leaves, that's bugs, that's bark, that's all of the living things that naturally fall down into our forests and onto our grasslands everywhere. The dead would be the dead bugs and the dead roots and the, the, um, the filaments left of fungus after they've died off and the, the chitin and the, um, the outside of the mycorrhizal fungus. These are all the dead things, the very dead. We're getting into um, deep rooted mycorrhizal fungus filaments that are gone, but their structure is still there. And we're also getting into fossil fuels and coal. These are all very uh, strong, long-term forms of carbon in the ground. Photosynthesis is the driver of all life. Um, and this is a really basic concept, but I think it's something that we often forget about and making that connection to the circle of life, that it all comes from sun. When sun hits green growing plants, we have photosynthesis. So we're taking carbon dioxide out of the air and essentially turning it into long chain carbons, which are sugars. One of my teachers, Elaine Ingham, uh, uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham, she's a soil microbiologist uh, in the United States. Um, she likes to call these the cakes and cookies that feed the microbes underground. So these, the chloroplasts inside of the leaves, you, you think of these leaves as like the first solar panel. These are the way that we draw carbon dioxide down to the earth. This is the way that we draw energy down to the earth. This is the way that we increase nutrient cycling. The sun shines on these chloroplasts, photosynthesis happens, long chain carbons appear and are sent down into plants and 
50% of that sunlight energy is invested by plants into their root system. It's like a selfless investment, but it's not really selfless because what they're doing is feeding the billions of microorganisms in the ground, many of whom like different kinds of sugars. Now it's important to acknowledge that the soil food web and our understanding of soil biology and nutrient cycling at this rate is pretty new. Um, we've known for a long time that soil was important, but it wasn't until the 90s that we coined the soil food web and scientists have begun to study really a lot about what's happening with these microorganisms in the ground, what are their interactions, who are they? Right now, about five to 20% of what is, we, we think we know about five to 20% of what is known about these different kinds of soil organisms. So that's really not a lot. So it's really important to keep in mind that we're kind of babes in this whole science of understanding how soil organisms interact with the rest of the world and drive cycles. But we are finding that it's incredibly important. So that 50% of sunlight, the sun has an energy budget, which is reflected in this image up on the screen, that 50% of sunlight that hits the ground, about 40% or 60% of that is invested by plants into the root system with those sugars that I've been talking about. And this is really important. So what we're looking at here is uh, that big brown fat thing in the middle of the screen is actually a very, very fine root hair. And the blue area around that is what's referred to as the rhizosphere. It's this very small area that surrounds every single root here. It's reflected a little bit in the picture of the tree, the blue area around the root system, it would be called the rhizosphere. And what we're learning now is that that rhizosphere is actually much larger than we would have anticipated, largely because of mycorrhizal fungus, which extends the root system far beyond the given plant or tree, allowing for communication among species, among um, different plants within the same species and uh, increasing selective intelligence in the soil so that plants can know what nutrients they need, what organisms they need to attract, what sugars they need to produce. And then those organisms produce organic acids, which dissolve sand, silt, and clay, which have all of the nutrients that all plants need. This is how forests and grasslands and natural ecosystems have been fed forever, um, right down to the first algae that attached itself to rock. In this slide, the little red dots that you're looking at are indicating biological organisms. So the bacteria, protozoa, and nematodes. The white lines coming in off the side are representative of those fungal hyphal strands, the part of the mycelium, which is a lot of fungal hyphal strands, and mycorrhizal fungus, which is a type of fungus. Those organisms are bringing in nutrients from outside the rhizosphere into the rhizosphere where roots can take that up. Those organisms all work together in a very intricate way. This is a map of the soil food web. Uh, this is from, I believe this is from Dr. Elaine Ingham's archives, but it is a really popular picture online. You can find it anywhere and it's, it's free to use. In this picture, we're seeing a web. All of these organisms are working together. And if we remove any one of them, the web doesn't work as well. So when we till soil, the first thing to die is the fungus. It's a very, very delicate system. When we kill the fungus, we've killed one whole part of the food web. We also generally are killing the nematodes and the protozoa, some of these secondary organisms. The bacteria are the first organisms that appear in soil, and we'll be talking a little bit more about that. And bacteria can produce those organic acids and they can break down sand, silt, and clay and they can hold all sorts of nutrients in their body, but they can't really move around unless they're in situ. So in, in the sort of goos and glues, snots and slimes produced by these organisms and waterways in the air pockets in soil. 
what we need in order to get the nutrients inside those bacteria available to plants are those other organisms that eat bacteria and poop them out in the rhizosphere. And those are nematodes and protozoa who are mobile. So a question I like to ask is if we know that rhizospheres are important places and that's where a lot of activity is happening and that's where nutrient cycling is happening and that's where carbon is being sequestered and moved through the carbon cycle, how can we increase living roots in the ground? This slide is um, from prairie plants, so they're not necessarily Vermont or New Hampshire plants, but the gardeners in the group will see very familiar plants in here, um, either because there are similar species to growing in here or things like echinacea and lupin, which many of us have in our gardens and in our fields, etc. I like to point out that uh, some of these plants can grow up to 15 feet or deeper if the soil system underneath can support that. In the Northeast, we have a lot of bedrock and we have a lot of rocky soil, some places more than others. And so these roots are gonna respond to those rocks and bend and not be able to go through them because a rock is the ultimate form of compaction and a root is gonna have a hard time getting through it. But probably some of you have seen that sometimes tree roots can bust through rock. So that's just an important thing to, to note. The other thing I really like to point out on this slide is in that red circle. Those, that's lawn. That is your standard lawn grass. And we have over 32 million acres of lawn in the United States alone. Um, and that de doesn't necessarily include all municipal grounds and golf courses and parks. And um, it's a hard number to keep track of. Much of that lawn used to be covered in biodiverse ecosystems with maximized diversity and nutrient cycling. So how can we increase the living roots in the ground? And can we build soil faster than the loss rate? The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization reports that if we continue globally with the kind of agriculture and uh, systems generally that we are, um, our styles of land management on the planet, we have about 60 harvests left. And when you look at this top picture, top right picture of corn in Iowa from 2018, you can see how that is. You can almost see that soil leaving in that still picture, the corn planted right up to the waterway as if the Dust Bowl never happened. It's been a long time and human memories are, are kind of short. Um, now, many people might wanna blame the farmer for growing this corn right up to the waterway, but I always like to make sure that people know that these farmers very often do not have the choice but to maximize the amount of production uh, on, on the land and to grow right up to the waterway because they're struggling economically and the banks and insurance companies are making decisions for them very often. So don't blame the farmer, blame the system, and in fact, don't blame it, let's just change it. The picture on the bottom right is a famous picture of Long Island Sound right after Tropical Storm Irene. And the brown section that you see in Long Island Sound and the Connecticut River, which is brown all the way through this picture, is representing the lost soil from our farm fields and dirt roads and other places in Vermont and New Hampshire that, and probably Massachusetts as well, um, that ended up in Long Island Sound. Now it was estimated that $800 million in infrastructure damage was done from Tropical Storm Irene. Um, that does not include losses to water quality or losses to topsoil that farmers and land managers and foresters have worked and plants and biological organisms have worked for a long time to create. Soil is very, very valuable and we don't put a price on it. And I'm not necessarily suggesting we do, but I do think we should put a value on it. So how do we avoid compaction and improve water infiltration? What is compaction? Compaction is it can be a very, very, very thin layer on top of a tilled garden. Um, many of the gardeners uh, in the webinar may uh, recall that sometimes we get rains, sometimes they're very heavy rains, 
and the your garden uh, won't actually get watered. The top will get watered and all the water will flow into your pathways. But if you dig your finger or something into the soil after the rain, you might find that it's dry an inch or two or three down. That is because there is a top layer of compaction that is formed when we till. And it seems counterintuitive, but it is the truth. We, when we till, we kill the life in the soil. And so there's no way for water and air to get back into the soil without organisms breathing and without plant roots conducting photosynthesis and sending those sugars into the ground. Compaction is also rock. Compaction is also found right underneath the tillage layer. So let's say you have a tiller that goes six inches deep. It's a guarantee that six or seven inches down, you're gonna have a pretty severe compaction layer. And if your tiller goes three feet deep, you're gonna have a compaction layer at three feet. So how do we avoid compaction? We put living roots in the ground and we encourage increased biological activity in our soils and we encourage maximized diversity above and below the ground. This is also how we improve water infiltration. What you're looking at on this screen on the top of the picture is a rainfall simulator. This is a, a really cool system that the NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service has. And they bring these out to schools and events and, uh, and farms. They're, these are all over the country and there is uh, one or two in Vermont NRCS can bring to your events as well. Um, we're looking at basically five cookie cutters of soil. And those are all gallon jars to give you a sense of the size of those cookie cutters. Underneath the cookie cutter is a screen to prevent the soil from falling out. These five blocks of soil are all taken from the same region so meaning they have the same uh, ratio of sand, silt, and clay. So it's the same soil type. What's different is the land management practices represented in each one of these soil blocks. And I like to refer to the soil health principles here. If we look at these five soil blocks, we can see that the one all the way to the left of the screen with the green growing grass, you can see at least one other plant species there we're gonna say that that one is following the soil health principles pretty well. We have green growing plants, living roots. We have some diversity. We have minimized disturbance. I'm assuming that's a pasture, but I could be wrong. So at some point, livestock might come through there and cause some disturbance, but they're not gonna create bare soil. They're gonna move on and they're gonna leave behind lots of nutrients, especially if the grazing is done well. On the right side of that slide, you have bare soil. And we're assuming that that's highly tilled soil, highly tilled, meaning often at least once a year, possibly more. And in between, you have a sort of a range of man management practices between those two. One could be no till. It looks like there's some corn stubble on one, but I don't really know what those land management practices are. But they're somewhere between bare soil and living roots in the ground. The jars underneath directly underneath those blocks are catching infiltration. So the amount of water that soaks into the soil and goes into the base layer of the soil and continues flowing through soil systems getting cleaned by soil. The jars in front are catching runoff. So this is wa water that is hitting a compaction layer and is running right off and taking soil with it. So let's look at those jars starting with the one with the green growing plants on top, you can see that the jar underneath is full and it's fairly clear. Now, more than likely that soil block has some water in it. That's the soil sponge that we're looking to build. And the rest of the water infiltrated into the base layer of the soil or what would have been if a jar wasn't there. And that water is fairly clear, showing us that healthy soil is a filter. And a way to infiltrate water in place to retain it through times of drought and to continue water cycling through soil systems. The front jar has nothing in it. There was no runoff. Four inches of rain, rain, <laughs> were from a shower head, were rained on all five of these blocks. Um, 
on the right side, when we're looking at that bare soil, we see that the jar underneath has zero water in it. So no water infiltrated through that bare soil. And the front jar is full and the color is about the same as the soil. So we lost all the water and some soil with it during that rainstorm. This is often brought around to farms um, by the NRCS throughout the country and uh, to help some of our best land managers understand how our land practices are actually affecting soil health and farmers are making changes as they can um, across the globe based on the increasing understanding of um, soil health. The bottom picture is just focusing on runoff and really just trying to get the point across that we can change how water is managed and how soil is managed by how we plan. When we have a city or all pavement or lots of pavement, we lose almost all of the water to runoff. We're not collecting any of it into the soil sponge where it's needed to sustain all life, including us. And on the left side, you're looking at a forest where if we have a, a system with maximized diversity and following all the soil health principles, we're actually retaining that water in the soil system and we're not running it off. So we tend to think of uh, rainwater as, as a waste product, um, at least in the way that we plan our towns and cities. When it rains, uh, we seem most interested in gathering that water and getting it down the drain as quickly as possible. And that's ultimately going out to the oceans and contributing to our ocean dead zones, which are indicated by those red dots on the map of the world there. That um, picture comes from National Geographic from some time ago. So I imagine that those dots, unfortunately, are, are quite a lot larger now. And if you were to lay this uh, ocean dead zone map out next to a map of land use globally, you would find that all of those red areas are directly correlated with uh, large tracts of land that are tilled regularly, producing uh, most of the commodity crops in this country and also the feed for livestock, which uh, often are, are not on pasture anymore. Um, not always true in Vermont. Got to give a good plug for the grass farmers in Vermont. They're doing really great work. On the bottom here, we're looking at some of the solutions. So rain gardens, um, water collection areas. If, if we were to take highway medians and, and stop, or not the highway medians, but the road medians and stop putting a curb around them and rather sunk them in so that water would go into living plants, how would that change things? Lots of possibilities and creative possibilities to infiltrate water, increase roots and living organisms um, and get ourselves through times of drought by building that soil sponge. These are some more rain gardens from all around. Uh, many of these are in New England. Um, UVM uh, up at the uh, Dudley Davis Center uh, lot, you can find lots of really cool um, experiments that the students have put together uh, to try and mitigate water runoff from their own parking lot and infiltrate it into the ground. Um, another thing I just want to point out again, that soil is a filter. So uh, parking lots and roads collect lots of toxins with them. When they send that water out to the ocean dead zones, all those toxins are going with them. If we can send that water first through a soil sponge, we're actually cleaning that water as well. We're starting to see more edible landscapes in more places, and that's really exciting. And I love to see hospitals. It may, just makes super good sense, right, for hospitals to be growing food, healthy food, um, and also to provide beautiful, aesthetic places where people can interact with plants. We, I think probably most of the people on this webinar um, understand the mental health benefits of gardening and working with plants and trees and natural ecosystems and soil. And there's a lot of research showing that actually the microbes that we get from soil on our fingertips are part of our good human biome. Um, so it's important to play in the dirt. Um, on the bottom here, we're looking at Fletcher Allen, um, the medical center up at UVM where they've had a rooftop garden for a long time. And this hospital um, has for many years also been focusing increasingly 
on getting more and more local food into their cafeteria. I believe their 100 mile radius is, is their goal, um, but it would be good to check in on their current stats. Those are old stats. I'm hoping they've improved. This picture, um, this is a little series from Thetford Elementary School where I've been running their um, school gardens and uh, edible landscape and compost system for um, 13 years now. Um, we've been composting there for about 10 years. We've had gardens since 2007. We started with seven raised beds. Um, we now have 14 spread throughout the schoolyard. We have a new um, principal's garden this year and a food service garden right out front of the school. We have apples, pears, peaches, raspberries, blueberries, cranberries, and strawberries growing throughout the schoolyard, a pumpkin patch, and a um, melon hill, we call it, where we have a big melon patch. The, the gardens here um, are all integrated into the curriculum, um, and increasingly, especially with the pandemic, um, we are working on uh, increasing the amount of food that we're producing and increasing the amount of outdoor classroom space and use so that when we do go back to school we can focus more around the food system to learn all of the standards that we need to learn um, there isn't anything you can't learn using the outdoors as a classroom um, and it's a really wonderful way to engage and now that we're moving into a world where students seem to be spending a lot of time on the screen um, I believe it's more important than ever to also get students outside to learn about our natural world. These are some of the fruits of our labor. Uh, the students do all of the harvesting. Um, they grow almost all of the plants in their classroom in normal years. This year, that didn't work out. Um, and they plant the gardens themselves. The summer school tends it throughout summer. In the fall, it's harvested. We serve all the food in the cafeteria. Uh, we have cider days, we make sauce and fruit leather, um, we make, we, uh, the kids have a mobile kitchen where they make raspberry breads and muffins, they make cranberry sauce, um, they really use it all and these are some of the wonderful pictures of people enjoying the food, you know, good healthy food at school produces smiles and healthy kids uh, and healthy communities and a lot of really good connection. Um, uh, bottom right, I like to point out that is our, our first peach ever that we grew at Thetford Elementary. It was pretty funny. It was a very large peach and it was the only one produced on that tree the first year. Uh, we split that five ways and really enjoyed it. Um, the woman holding the bag of pears and the woman who is uh, spooning out apple crisp, those are our two food service directors at school and they're incredibly supportive. They're gardeners themselves and they love putting local food healthy, fresh food into the kids' mouths and into the school lunches. Um, you'll often see trays of fresh sliced foods, like you see on the bottom left there, available for students in our cafeteria uh, throughout the school year. This is our compost system at school. Um, we manage about 180 pounds of fresh food a week uh, when school is in session. Uh, and that includes meat and bones and dairy and, and everything. Every single thing goes in there, um, including, unfortunately, some fruit cups and things like that. But they come out looking just the same on the other side. Um, managing uh, this system uh, is really fun. The sixth graders do almost all of the work. We do have a team of adults that support it. The students collect data, which is what they're doing there. They're taking the temperature of the compost. They do that every day in three places, and that data becomes the basis for their math and science curriculum. Um, that, and they love it because we get to ask questions and answer, um, answer questions and find new questions using data that they produced. Um, fourth graders are often the ones that turn out the compost, and the little kids in school grow their pumpkin patch on top of our compost windrows. One of the groups that I manage um, in the Upper Valley is Upper Valley Apple Corps. Um, this is a group of incredible, incredibly knowledgeable and passionate um, community members, largely focused in the White River Junction area, but throughout the Upper Valley, who came together, I think back in 2010, um, to start a raspberry revolution. And they, they put in a raspberry revolution park. I have a picture of that coming up. Um, here we are planting fruit trees on the town hall property, and that was our town manager in the orange shirt 
they're um, welcoming us and uh, being a part of that great celebration. So we have two apple trees and two pear trees on the town, uh, in front of the town building, and we have other fruit trees in the back uh, and the adjacent park. We also have blueberry bushes and we have plans for a lot more once, once town offices open again. All of the fruits, um, we, we plant a lot of fruit trees and nut trees and then guilds around our trees to support those. And I'll get into that in a little bit as well. Everything we plant is free for the picking. We also do the education and classes in town all free to support how to manage the trees, how to prune them, how to uh, manage guilds, how to use the fruit once it comes off the trees, make fruit leather, cider, sauce. And when we have those public events, we make a lot of cider and sauce and we give it all away. We're especially focused on low income populations and we try to really make sure that we're planting food in the communities where we have food insecure people um, and connecting them to the food um, that's growing all around them and, and uh, sharing our skills uh, and also gaining skills from our neighbors. This is Raspberry Revolution Park. Um, it has a much nicer sign now, but there's a little story here. Um, so on the top, you're looking at the Raspberry Revolution Park and notice the, the row of cedars behind that sign. On the bottom picture, you're looking at the back side of those cedars where we have four fruit trees. Um, this is right next to the Cover Home Repair Store in White River Junction, right on the main road. And this little park has been an incredible place where, where neighbors come together and they share raspberry bread and strawberry bread and um, smoothies and they get to know each other and it's just incredible. People come by as they're walking the street and just pick a handful of berries and keep moving on. Well, a few weeks ago, um, we were told that this little plot, this was an abandoned plot for a long time and we got permission to, to plant here. Um, the owner was raising all of our plants uh, because they're gonna put up a building there. So we got almost no notice. Um, Apple Corps rallied bunch of volunteers came, they dug up all the raspberries and they moved them over to the community garden just across the railroad tracks in Ratcliffe Park and White River Junction. So we now have expanded our Raspberry Revolution Park um, because this was 10 years old, so there were a lot of thinnings uh, to work with. So we're now, um, we're now expanding that and it's also over at the Center for Transformational Practice, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, these are two pear trees planted at Kilton Library in West Lebanon. Um, and when we planted these trees, there really wasn't a lot of food growing at the library, but in the years since those trees went in the ground, the library now has a community garden right outside the library where they welcome library patrons and West Lebanon uh, residents to have beds, which is incredible. And these fruit trees are right next to those beds. Last year, I went into the library right when, they, when I took these pictures, when these pears were perfect and ripe, and I let the librarian know that the pears were ripe. And, and she said, oh, that's so great. I'm gonna have a bowl of pears available for all library patient, patrons until those pears are gone. And she did. And I heard reports of people going to the library and getting a fresh pear. And that's just perfect. This is the Center for Transformational Practice in White River Junction. And it is bordering Ratcliffe Park. Um, the, the sports field there is Ratcliffe Park. Um, and the Center for Transformational Practice is, um, it's a private group, but the, all the land is open to the public. They have um, a, a garden there, a very large security garden, um, food security garden, and um, a food forest that we've been planting together for a number of years. The brown line shown on the big map there is um, the forest garden trail. So that is a part of a larger project um, indicated by the map on the bottom left. Um, the, and on that map, you'll see a green line, a red line, and a blue line. That is a three-phase project of what will be the River Walk Trail, taking us up along the Connecticut River to the confluence of the Connecticut and the White River um, through what we hope will become a food forest. The first trail is already a growing food forest and it is open and the public is welcome to walk there. It is, uh, the trailhead is found at the corner of the ball field in Ratcliffe Park. Uh, we have planted a bunch of trees in here and we've also recovered a lot of wonderful pollinator trees, um, important species like uh, pagoda dogwood and, and a lot of cherry trees. We have found remnants 
of trees that used to grow there, uh, likely planted by our Abenaki neighbors because this has been and it still is an incredibly important region, um, confluence of two rivers, it's culturally rich. So we hope that the second phase of our trail will be the Abenaki Trail, where we can learn more about our Abenaki neighbors that live all around us and, and learn from them as we have done for so, so many years. Um, so we hope that this will continue as a, a recreational project that will also increase access to the river um, and increase knowledge about uh, food plants and also a lot of invasive plants. So this area has been incredibly ravaged and disturbed over many years, um, some through natural disturbances like flooding um, and others because it's been a dump spot for, for a long time. So when we first started building this food trail, we hauled out truckloads and truckloads of couches and refrigerators and beds and you name it. I mean, things that we could hardly even identify. We, we hauled out of there um, and then replaced with um, cover crops and native plants and uh, really getting the, the forest back healthy. But something we couldn't do is remove the invasive species. There are so many, every kind you can think of, and they're all doing really well here. So instead of removing them, which really you can't do, um, they're here to stay. Um, we're gonna use that as an educational opportunity to teach people about some of these plants. This is the Edible Pocket Park in Stratford. It's actually in South Stratford. And um, I highly recommend like take a trip to come here. This place is amazing. Um, it was originally, um, uh, the, the idea came to Barb and Wally Smith who they, they did this whole park pretty much single-handedly. They, they get rallied volunteers um, from the community and they worked a lot with the elementary school right across the street from this park to plant lots of bulbs. Um, so years ago, they, uh, as a part of Upper Valley Apple Corps, they had gotten a couple of fruit trees and they planted them along the main road in Stratford. Um, that's what we encourage is for people to adopt trees, plant them in their community, and then make it known that that fruit is available to everyone. And as they were planting those trees, they looked over at the bend in the river and they saw this little peninsula and they thought, gosh, this would be an amazing pocket park, um, which I just, I love the name and the place is incredible. Um, each one of those little green clumps is actually a different kind of guild. So we have a blueberry guild there and a plum guild, and we have apple guilds. Um, there is a kiosk there with maps to give you a little more inf information about those guilds. And a guild is just a community that supports, right? So you have artist guilds and you have um, carpenters guilds. Well, plant guilds are groups of plants that support each other and usually a central species. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. I have a slide coming up to talk about guilds. Um, but I highly recommend this place. Uh, people get married here. They have birthday parties. Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts come. People have picnics. There are picnic tables, um, statues. It's accommodating. There's even a place to put your dog poop because <laughs> uh, a lot of people bring their dogs here. And that river is an incredible swimming hole. Uh, so check it out. So guilds, an association of people working towards a common goal and a group of plants working toward a common goal, um, which, you know, in nature, that's survival and pro productivity. Uh, so uh, what you're looking at here is a, this is kind of an old version of one guild that we, we planted uh, in Apple Corps. Um, this was put together by two dear friends and members of Apple Corps, some of the founding members, Karen Ganey, who runs Permaculture solutions, um, a wealth of knowledge, an amazing practitioner uh, in permaculture, and Elizabeth Cadle, who is the garden manager uh, and garden lab manager at the Center for Transformational Practice, also an incredible wealth of knowledge uh, in permaculture and, and many other things. So they worked on this, and the brown uh, line in the middle is a tree, and all of the plants around it are listed there. So there are five basic functions in a guild. Um, you can think about which species, and some plants like certain species near them, but what I like to think about is the function of plants. We don't know enough about how plants work together or how soil organisms work with plants to really know which species are perfect for which thing. So we can think about their functions. One function is a nitrogen fixture. 
Um, so these are plants, leguminous plants like um, um, lupin and like alfalfa and clover and certain trees like uh, locust trees, many other plants that are leguminous and they fix nitrogen uh, out of the air using um, in partnership and collaboration with a couple of species of organisms in the soil that are rhizomaceous bacteria and those help to fix nitrogen on those plants. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. There are also dynamic accumulators. These are plants with a deep taproot, things like dandelion or comfrey um, and, and even lupin. Uh, so some plants can have multiple functions um, and those are my favorite plants or the ones that have lots of functions that they can provide. Um, for ecosystems. And those dynamic accumulators, that taproot can go down, it can often break through compaction, it can bring up nutrients from the subsoil using all the organisms uh, that exist in the rhizosphere to bring those up to not only that plant but other plants including the central fruit tree. Another function is a suppressor. So these are plants that um, that suppress insects or suppress diseases or, or things like that. Uh, daffodils, alliums like garlic and onion, walking onions, even some of those globe onions that we love to have is just beautiful uh, flowers in our gardens. Artemisia is another one, you know, so plants that can um, serve as a, a suppressant. Then there are mulching plants, and these are plants with big leaves. These are comfrey, these are hostas, these are burdock, um, some of the sorrels, um, that these leaves come down even on the living plant and they suppress the ground around it, um, uh, making it so that other plants can't grow. And those leaves decompose into the soil system, feeding all of the organisms underground. The fifth one is attractors. Um, and attractors are all the flowering plants, and especially those plants that have teeny, teeny, tiny flowers like yarrows and a lot of the culinary herbs we like to use, a lot of our native wildflowers also that have co-evolved with all of the insects that live around us. So we have five basic functions. We have nitrogen fixers, dynamic accumulators, suppressors, mulchers, and attractors. As we rethink our lawns, we could be re rethinking those with some of these functional plants. How can we rethink our lawns? How can we shrink our lawns? And I'm not suggesting we get rid of lawns. I love to roll around on the lawn, check for ticks afterwards. Um, I love to have my bare feet in the lawn. I like to play lawn games. I like to have places where I can sit with benches and I like lawn paths. But do we really need to have 32 million acres of lawn, which is more than any one single crop that is grown in this country. Um, while we might have more than 50, 50 million acres in cropland, individually, we don't have any one species in cropland like we do lawns. And most lawns are single species. And most, most people who maintain lawns go to great pains to take out any other species that pops up in their lawn. So how can we rethink lawns? When we think about mowing lawns, that's one way that we can rethink them. When we mow lawns down to one or two inches, you can see on the right side of this slide that we're, we're basically using up all of the plant energy and we're killing off the root system underground. We're stressing that plant immensely, which creates a situation where we're constantly struggling to have healthy lawns. Um, this is why there's no root system supporting them. There are mixes that are available and increasingly more mixes available of multiple species of lawn grasses. Uh, most of our hardware stores and feed supply stores have something called a conservation mix, which is rye, fescue, and clover, and that's three species, um, two grasses and one legume. Um, so that's pretty good. That's a place to start. Um, but what about five, 10, 20, 50 species? When we look at grasslands, it's not one species. Nowhere in nature does nature produce a single species anything um, or a field with only three species in it. So how can we mimic nature when we're thinking about our lawns? Can we shrink some of our lawns? Can we um, allow some of our lawn to grow higher so that the natural wildflowers bloom and then we just brush hog it once a year? Um, can we mow to four or five inches? Um, organic lawn care specialists that I know 
um, say that if their clients mow below four inches, the contract is broken because they understand that with at least, you need at least four inches, and I would argue more than that, to conduct photosynthesis um, and to support the life above and below the ground. When, um, when we let the, the grass grow even taller, you can see that the root system is also growing. And so that's carbon, all the living, all the dead, all the very dead, every single bit of a plant and all the organisms that are with it are carbon, that's biomass. So how do we increase biomass, not just on the land surface, but in height above it and in depth below it? This is my lawn um, and this is pretty recent. Um, so you can see the dandelions and the violets. Um, Actually, this is last year's lawn, and you can see that it, I might have mowed it once based on based on the little cuts on the top of that that grass. Um, so I have in there I have violets, I have clover, um, I have rye, I have fescue, I have dandelions, I have buckthorn plantain, I have sorrel, I have daffodils, I have other bulbs that pop up. Um, and when wildflowers pop in there, I let them be underneath that grass. You might find some lichens and some mosses in places. Um, you might find some other really teeny tiny plants that I don't know what they are. But if you laid a hula hoop down on this grass, you could count many species within that hoop, um, which is a trick I often use to measure change over time in a certain area. Keep laying that hula hoop down in the same place year after year and see how your lawn is changing or how any of your ecosystems are changing. This is a clover root system. This is from white, Dutch white clover. Um, this is from one of my gardens. It's a plant that I encourage in my plant guilds in my vegetable garden. So I really try to avoid bare soil of any kind unless I'm growing lettuce or carrots or something. And uh, in case you're interested, uh, you could go to my website and watch a regenerative gardening video where I talk a lot more about the um, experiments that I've done in my garden with, with no-till and polyculture guild systems in my garden. Um, so the white balls that you're looking at here on this root system are, are actually little nitrogen balls. These are fixed by those couple of species of bacteria that collaborate together to fix nitrogen and turn it from one form of nitrogen into another form that is plant available. If you don't have all the species needed, it won't happen. You may still get balls on your plants, but if you break them open, uh, you would notice that there's no color inside. So if you break these open, um, and if they're larger balls, I've seen these get up to the size of marbles or more in very healthy systems, in teeny, teeny, tiny, almost unrecognizable in systems that are obviously pretty unhealthy in terms of nutrient cycling. Uh, if you slice one of these balls open and you see pink or red inside, that's an indication that you have all the biology that is fixing the nitrogen, and then that nitrogen is available to other plants. So when we're thinking about plants to choose in to replace our lawns, excuse me, or to increase our lawns, or to use for plant guilds, or to increase the depth of roots in our gardens, there are some things we really should be thinking about diversity in species, diversity in types of plants, diversity in heights and textures and leaf shape and size, uh, diversity in timing of plants, so annuals and perennials, um, spring ephemerals and plants that go in summer and also those that come out in fall, making sure that there are flowers all season long and not just at one time. So attracting insects is a really important thing, but how do you keep them around? You need habitat. Um, and those, so understanding plant habitat species is also important. Getting diverse structures above and below the ground. So think about those root systems. We look at what is above the ground, and I love that too. That's part of the aesthetics. It's our food producers. But if we start to think about the root structure of plants and what those look like, thinking back to that slide at the beginning where you saw lots of different root systems, be thinking about that. Which roots go lateral, like strawberries or gill over the ground? Or which roots are deep tap roots, like comfrey or dandelion? And which roots spread out all over the place? Um, which ones create big... Um, balls of root systems underneath them because those root systems actually collaborate with each other. We often think of weeds as being a problem, um, as you know, we got to get them out of there. 
but in nature, all of those plants are able to grow together and nobody's robbing each other's nutrients because they're all providing for the soil food web, which is providing nutrient exchange for all of the plants in the system. Hey, Kat, this is yeah. this is Gwen. I just wanted to time check. We're at about 11 o'clock, so I wasn't sure how much longer if you wanted to wrap up a few more Yeah, items. No, let's wrap up. Let's okay. wrap up. Um, and I hope somebody asked questions about um, edible landscapes, uh, ecosystem succession. I'm sorry that I went a little over. So yeah, let's wrap up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to escape out of my screen, and I think we've done enough. OK, great. Um, so let's see. Uh, we do have a few questions. I want to be respectful of folks' times, but there's a really great question here by Courtney Rose. Uh, Kat mentioned the trail project at Ratcliffe Park um, that they could not remove invasives. Do the invasives hinder hinder growth or reproduction rate and quality of the edible tree species? And are there other challenges that the invasive species create for the trail project? Do you have solutions? Um, yes, there are lots of challenges. Um, solutions are just people going in and making sure the path is cleared. Um, some of the species that we're looking at there are buckthorn, um, bayberry, uh, euonymus, um, the multiflora rose. Um, these are incredibly difficult species to remove. And if we did remove them, we would actually be hurting the ecosystem at this point by um, devastating the soil in order to get them out. Um, it's also riverside soil where we need lots of roots in, in the ground to stabilize the soil. Um, so what we're doing is learning how to use these plants and control them in places where we need to. Um, we're eating the garlic mustard, for instance, that's there. Um, and then we, we cut it down before it goes to flower to try and decrease its continued growth there. Um, we manage the raspberries well. Um, the multiflora rose will sometimes cut at the base and rip the root out with a root wrench, um, but we'll leave it up in the tree because pulling it down would damage the tree. So um, it's a complicated question to answer shortly, but I would invite you to come and check the place out. Um, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you. There's a few more questions, but if you don't mind, I'll email those to you and get answers to folks. Um, yeah. but thank you so much for your time and energy on this. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise. Um, again, this will be recorded and I'll send out the link later today. Thank you so much, Kat, and have a good rest of your day. You're welcome. Thanks so much for tuning in, folks. Bye now.